Amen. 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 How y'all doing? All right. All right. I'm glad uh, to be here. Let's get down to business. Why don't you stand with me real quick? Let's pray. Let's get down to business. My time is limited. Um, today, Father, we thank you, honor you for this time and honor you for the opportunity to come before a generation today and speak into their destiny that you have set up before the foundations of the earth. What an honor and a privilege it is for you to drop heaven's uh, morsels so that folks' lives can be uh, gps towards heaven's code. And so God, today I just pray that you would ferociously change lives and light somebody up more effectively for Jesus and that someone that doesn't know Jesus Christ would meet Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So I need heaven's power. I need the power that makes preaching easy. I, I need that power that, uh, tr that you do to open up hearts and eyes to see what only the Spirit, the ghost of God, can give clarity to see. So let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh God, our strength, our Redeemer in whom we trust. Uh, Lord, help your people and those who don't know you to not just be hearers of the word, deceiving themselves, but doers. Help them to receive the engrafted word of God, which is able to save their souls. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Everybody agree with that said? Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. I'm glad once again to be at your convocation and excited to be able to share with you with the time that we have. There, there has been a message that I have been uh, challenged by some of my preacher friends to communicate um, as much as possible. Um, they, they sort of alerted me uh, to the importance of it, and I, I really didn't uh, see the importance of it until over time as God has challenged me, sort of, kind of from an evangelistic fervor, from a pastor's standpoint, uh, uh, to communicate uh, um, um, this message. And as we dive in today, it just reminds me that, that your generation has it differently than so many other generations that have ever existed on planet Earth. And I know that every generation, some speaker stands up and says that to each generation, but, 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 but I think that th this is the time where it really applies true because in, in, in many ways and in many shapes and in many forms, there is more informational exposure to you guys than any other generation that has ever lived on the planet Earth. Because we're in a technological, digital age, uh, um, um, things can happen within five seconds versus a 24-hour informational cycle period. And so you have everything from Instagram. How many of y'all on Instagram? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many of y'all on Twitter? Yeah, y'all like Twitter's for old people. Okay, so Facebook. Vine. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, all of these different information streams. Then you got the World Wide Web, and there's so much information out there, even on TV. You got, you got E, you got BET. I know y'all don't watch that here because y'all are Christian school, but, um, um, <laughs> Um, you know, MTV, you got VH1. I mean, you, you have a massive amount of exposure. I mean, you don't have to go to concerts anymore. You can just pull up YouTube and be like, plot out, there you are at the concert, literally, right? And so in light of that reality, there's a lot of information being spouted forth and spewed forth at you every single second of every single day that's competing for your attention. But, 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 but I would surmise that there's not just competition, competition for uh, 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 your attention. I would say that, that there's also competition for your mind and for your heart. You, 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 you see, you, you see, it's not just entertainment that, that, that is grasping you and wanting your attention. It wants to edutain you, education while entertaining you. And, and, and friends, I want to let you know today that as a believer in Jesus Christ, you can never shut your grid off. 
Your grid is that thing that God gives every believer with the ability to say, this is of God and this is not. We're not demonizing culture and saying all of those outlets are wrong and rooted in the devil. However, that we live in a fallen world with destructive systems and challenges all over the place. And if you don't learn as a believer in Jesus Christ, if you do know him, if, if you don't learn as a believer that you have the mind of Christ because of Jesus' finished work on the cross, and that you say, I want to build a biblical worldview that fights against, that challenges anything that would be substandard of what God would want me to think. And, and that's what brings me to our subject today uh, of this message that has been burning in me uh, to talk to uh, this generation about. I want to talk about today breaking free from strongholds. I want to talk about breaking free from strongholds. This is important for you because I really want you to recognize that as you go on break, you're going to go back to a whole bunch of things. And as you transition out of school, you're going to transition through some things. You've had some upbringing, whether you were in a Christian home or not, where you have been jacked up by somebody. Jacked up means some bad things that made your mind get whacked out, okay? Just in case we needed a translator. And so, and so, and so in light of that reality, the Bible has a phenomenal phenomenal feat to talk about this idea of strongholds. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6, it's probably a, a phenomenal passage that really lays the foundation for us understanding this issue of strongholds. You can hold your finger there, or, or if you got your, your, your device out, uh, I, I, I hope as many of you as possible are actually looking in the Scriptures. I'll be reading from the ESV version of the Bible. And not only that, we'll be over in Joshua chapter 6, just briefly. Let's look at this. It says in verse 3, it says, For though, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 6. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. It says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought. Somebody says every thought. Okay, yo, uh oh, let's do that one more time, one more again. Let's say take every thought. That's much better. Captive to obey Christ being ready to punish every disobedience when it, your obedience is complete. And so my, my man Paul, as he's chopping up the text and diving into the scriptures, trying to give some, some, I mean, he's trying to give some flagrant philosophies of life to sort of help the people of God. I'm okay up here, right? I'm okay, okay, I wanna make sure. All right, um, um, I don't wanna get out of camera range or nothing. Um, it's very important that you recognize what, what, what he's talking about. Paul is talking about the issue of the people of God having their thinking being governed by the scriptures. And so when he talks about their reality, he's talking about strongholds. He said he wants our lives, God wants our lives to, to, to be filled with bringing down and challenging anything that exalts itself above the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. This is of phenomenal importance for every single believer's life. And so, and so what, what, what's crazy about this is what a stronghold is. What, what, a stronghold is this, a stronghold means a fortified place. It means a bastion or anything that is in opposition to what God wants. In the Old Testament, we'll see in a few minutes that, 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 it's, that, that it can be a lofty place, the highest place in your life where you put the thing of greatest importance. And so therefore, a stronghold, a stronghold is, is, is gonna, we're gonna see it right here. It says a stronghold is a mindset. Somebody say mindset. A stronghold is a mindset value system or thought process that hinders your growth. It is a mindset value system value system or thought process that hinders your growth. So in your life, there, there, there are things that you believe that you don't recognize that is an unbelieving belief system that doesn't believe what God wants you to believe because it's alternative to them. I, 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 I'm the first to say it today. I'm gonna just let you know now that I'm a recovering unbeliever. Okay. And I'm, and, and I'm, a, and when you become a believer, you are in a treatment program. 
Every last one of us are recovering from uh, being addicted to unbelief. If you, don't, if you came from death, spiritual death to spiritual life, you're going to wrestle through going through uh, 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 unbelief anonymous to be able to deal with your unbelief issues. And so the Christian life is filled with you coming to terms with your unbelief. Christ has saved you by grace alone, through faith alone, through Christ alone. So you're saved and you're justified. But what happens is you enter a process called sanctification. Somebody say sanctification. And this process of sanctification by which God grows you from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity is filled with a ferocious, a ferocious devil that wants to come against everything that God is trying to rot in your life, come to rot in your life, everything that God is trying to replant. So your, your, your sanctification is a belief time where every single area of your life is being challenged, where you have places of unbelief that's in your life. I like the way David Wilkerson talks about strongholds. He says, most of us think of strongholds as bondages, such as sexual trespasses, drug addictions, addictions. He says, alcoholism. He says, outward sins we put at the top of our worst sins list. Check this out. He says, but Paul is referring to something much worse and more diabolical. He says, a, a, a stronghold is her, holding firmly to an argument. He says, a stronghold is an accusation planted firmly in your mind by Satan to establish falsehoods, misconceptions, especially regarding the nature of who God is. And so what the fight is going to be as you're trying to be here, at, and I, that's why I love Liberty University, is because it's trying to get Christians to develop a biblical worldview in every single sector of the world so that as we go out as tent makers into different sectors of the world and challenge everything from media, challenging everything from music, challenging everything from politics, uh, law, uh, every single layer of society, education, uh, 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 agriculture, aviation, every single level of everything needs the mind of God bleeding into it, but it only happens as your life is changed, as your life is challenged, as your life is growing, as your life becomes submitted to God's way of thinking and God's way of doing things so that therefore everywhere you go, he goes and everywhere you go, his mindset goes. Every time you're changed, something changed because you are the multivitamin pill of the kingdom that God wants to plant globally all over the place to see the world change through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so as you, as you begin to think about this, you have to ask yourself, what areas of my life am I entrenched in a stronghold in which pulls me to my man Gideon? I love my man Gideon. Um, he's a true G because his name starts with G. And so what we're going to talk about real quick in these last few minutes is my man's life. Turn to Judges 6. Now this is dope right here. Y'all, not drug dope, but dope good, okay? Um, uh, uh, um, so I don't want nobody saying, don't get him back no more. He's talking about dope. Dope just means good, okay? So that's, that's what it's, we say in my neighborhood. Um, so <laughs> Judges chapter 6, Judges chapter 6, verse 11 through 16. I want you to really, really track with me on this, okay? He, it says, now the angel of the Lord came uh, and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, not Oprah, but Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite while his son Gideon was beating wheat out in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all, uh, where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned and said to him, go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you. And he said to him, please. He said, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest Manasseh in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And Gideon said, and the Lord said to him, 
but I will be with you. Verse 25. It says, and then, by, then that night the Lord said to him, take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down. Somebody say pull down. The altar of Baal that, is, that your father has and cut down the Asherah, cut down the Asherah that is beside it and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold with the stones laid in due order. This is Bowman right here. This is Bowman. So what we begin seeing is that God is now uh, 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 doing something that he loves to do, which brings me to my first point. If, if you are going to break free of strongholds, the first thing you got to have is an encounter with God. You got to have an encounter with God. My man Gideon is beating weed up under the wine press. You know what I'm saying? Um, in other words, he's acting a fool because you can't just run past this. He's, he's acting sort of foolish right here. And so what happens is you would go out to the threshing floor and, and you would thresh wheat and let the wheat separate from the tares. But he's not doing that because the people of God are doing what's right in their own eyes based on Judges chapter 17, verse 6. Because they're walking and doing what is right in their own eyes, what's happening is, is they're, they're functioning in a way that God doesn't want them to function. So they're functioning in functional dysfunction. I'm going to come back to that in two seconds. But what's funny is, is that God, God is the coolest God on the planet because your man Gideon don't even know that this is the Lord God, but he's the smoothest God ever. He appears under a terebinth tree chilling under the joint, right? He's just chilling. Then all of a sudden, he looking at my man Gideon. Now God, God invented cloaking technology, right? So God, Gideon can't see God right now. So, so, so get, God is cloaked, you know what I'm saying? Like some straight Star Trek type stuff, right? You know what I'm saying? So he's, he's, he's backed up in the cut just looking at him. He said, he's just watching Gideon just act a fool up in his stronghold, functioning dysfunctionally. Because all of us got functional dysfunctionality. I don't care what type of household you grew up in. You got issues. Yeah, you, you, yeah, amen, amen. I'm glad y'all agree. Every last one of us is jacked up. And, and, and what happens is he's functioning in this functional dysfunctionality and, 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 and doesn't really know it. All of us function in functional dysfunctionality. You function in functional dysfunctionality when you're functioning substandard of what God wants you to do and you think that's normal. Okay, let me, let me see if I can make a plan. My wife, I got a confession to make, my wife has made me watch Home and Garden TV. Um, and it's the show, though, that I like to see every now and then. The joint is called Hoarders. You ever seen Hoarders? How many of y'all seen Hoarders before? Now, now, what trips me out is, man, the people be in cribs that, man, um, it'd be cat, 1,900 cats in the house, um, all types of, uh, of bodily matter, we'll just say that, everywhere. You know, and so they, they, you can smell the house from two miles away. You know, so the hoarders people come up in the spot, you know what I'm saying? And they're like, oh my God, what's happening up in here? And you know what I'm saying? Somebody died of it. It's like CSI situations, right? Um, some, and, and the person in there just telling, hi, come in. And you're like, hold on, don't you see that it's trifling in here, right? I mean, I mean, don't you know? It's, it's, it's sort of nasty in this. And, and, and the person's just like, and, I mean, do you smell that? And then, then they offer, you want something to eat? No, I don't want anything to eat, drink, or anything that will enter my body from this spot, right? But, but, but what's interesting is that the person has been so long in this condition that they don't recognize that something that used to stink has now become a perfume to them. When you're in a stronghold, many times you will be in a place of hoarding your sin and being in a place of demonic stench, and you won't even know it until someone comes in from the outside. That's why I like the fact that in the text, God doesn't wait to get in, gets it right to help him to deal with his strongholds. He shows up at his worst point. Now, oh, y'all looking at me funny. Let me, let me just tell you, just because you were Christian school, you've had your worst points though. Each and every one of you have been at a bad place. And God loves you when you're in that bad place, not when you try to get it right on your own. See, that's what I love about the living God. God will show up in the midst of your mess. Now, you're going to see in a second, God is going to uncloak himself. So the cloak of technology is going to say, then he's going to show himself. Now, Gideon going to be uh, doing wheat in the wine press. And it's like, you know, he, said, he says, hey, what's up, mighty man of valor? Now, you got to understand, he ain't see him, now he see him. He like snuck up on him. And Gideon just starts talking to him. Let me just tell you something. 
In my neighborhood, you sneak up on me, I'm like, hold on, back up, who is that? <laughs> who that? Huh? You know what I'm saying? You know, just walk up on me, you know what I'm saying? But when God shows up, it's, it, when God shows up, it's crazy what the first thing God says to him. He says, oh, mighty man of valor. Now this dude is acting like a sucker and a punk right now because he's the guy that doesn't want to get into a fight. He's like trying to hide and God calls him one of the best fighters in the world. He calls him a mighty man of valor. Mighty man of valor didn't mean you was in the general army or, or what have you. It, it means literally that you were the special ops dude. You know, the what, we ready for whatever type dude. You know what I'm saying? You know, have you ever been around somebody? They, now, I know it don't happen at Liberty, but they just like to fight. They, if they waiting for something to happen so they can just use their weaponry. That's, that's a mighty man of valor. You know what I'm saying? It'd be like 300 people over there and you with this crazy, dumb, nitwit kind of guy. And he said, hey! You're like, hey, stop, man. Then we could take 300 of them. You take 300 of them, man. We ain't going to, it's like the 300 when they were like, you ready? You ready? 300 against all the army. Ah, and go after them, right? That's the mighty man of valor. But what's funny is when God sees us in our stronghold, he doesn't see us based on where we are. He sees us based on what it looks like when he gets to us. God is the worst chooser of people on the planet Earth. I'm gonna just tell you why. In my neighborhood, when you go to the basketball court, you don't just choose whoever. You make sure you go there with either your squad or you know the cats on the block who would, you know, playing nice, real nice like, that, that, you know, get them on your team so you can make it, take it, stay on the court, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, they come on the court, they had their, their, their shorts on and, you know, their Jordans on. And then they, and they, and they, and they come out and God have on his sweatbands and the Holy Spirit looking around. And, um, and, 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 God, and God the Spirit say, who are you going to choose, Pop? Um, God the Father be like, chewing some gum, looking around the court. He's like, let's choose him. He said, him? Yeah, nobody's picking him. Come on. You're like, who, me? I ain't played in a while. Boom, he shoots over there. Then he says, homegirl over there, homegirl, come here. Let's play on the team, play down. Then all of a sudden, you're playing on God's team. God picks the worst team. He wouldn't pick the team that we could pick because he picks people based on them not having anything. And when he gets to them, he'll give them the skill and the strength that they need to be on his team because he doesn't see you based on where you are. He sees you based on what it looks like when he comes into your life. Jesus Christ did the same thing. Jesus Christ picked the worst team. He picked spoiled rich kids. He picked mama's boys, he picked prostitutes, demon-possessed people, all to be um, into one community for him. Now, if he picked that type of people, we all got a chance at this thing. <laughs> and so in verse 25, you see that he goes in and God finally gets him to be obedient and challenges him. After he's asked God some very, very hard questions. He's asked God some very, very hard questions and God still doesn't let Gideon's questions get in the way of them. He said, I want you to pull down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah. And when he tells him to do this, he finds out that these strongholds are in his pop's crib, in his pop's house. So in other words, these things are not just rooted in Gideon's generation, but it's generationally beyond his generation. But Gideon is called to tear these things down. What I love about the Lord is he doesn't just lead him to tear stuff down. He leads him to tear stuff down, but then he tells him to put an altar to me in the place where that altar was in the first place. He says, when he tore these things down, it was crazy, because he's gonna call you to deal with some mindsets, some unbelief systems, some broken sexuality. Some of you have been probably molested and had bad experiences and maybe have been raped or had hypocritical parents that praise God on Sunday but acted a fool during the week and it confused your Christianity. Some of you are in different spots in different places in your belief. You're here at a Christian school, you kind of amen everything, but you're kind of not into this whole Christian thing because there's things in your mindset that are unbelieving belief system that God wants to tear down. And so in light of that, God gives you an encounter with him so that he can begin letting you ask all the questions. And what I love about God, he's not scared of your questions. 
Gideon starts rolling through these questions. Where have you been? Where are all these miracles? And God say, I, I'm still going to use you. In the midst of you having all these questions, don't try to use that to get me off the beaten path of using you. That's what I love about God. And what he does is he calls him to tear down the stronghold. So you got to tear down the mindsets in your life. You got to go to the place of your greatest unbelief. And what, what you, I, I don't know what that area of unbelief is. You know what that area of unbelief is. And you have to go and you have to tear that thing down. And then you have to, in the place of it, replace it with a mindset that comes from the living God based on the scriptures so that you can have a fortified place and a true believing belief system where the power of God and the transformational power of Christ can rule and reign. Because I'm just telling you right now, if you don't deal with your strongholds, you're going to read those strongholds and those things are going to get onto your children. It's going to get in your spheres of influence and it's going to cause challenges. And if you want to really be unleashed for God's glory, you have to deal with every single thing in your life. And what I like about God is God doesn't judge you if you open up the door and let you deal with your mess. One of the things as a close, uh, when, I, when we were getting our building exterminated at Epiphany Fellowship, uh, you know, we, we, we bought this building in the inner city of Philadelphia, and um, it was rats and roaches everywhere. I'm talking about everywhere in the building. And so the exterminator said something to me and my staff that was very, very important. He says, when I come there, when I come there, I want you to open up every single door in the building. I want you to open up everything. And I said, why do you want us to open up everything? He said, I want you to open up every, every, anything that has a door on it. I want you to open it up. And I, and, I, and I said, why do you want us to do that? He said, because, he said, because if you leave something closed and I don't deal with everything, he said, it will infest other areas. That's how your life is, and God invites you. God invites you to open up those closed areas of your life during this time. God, uh, God, God, God's, God's, God is doing that because God, listen, I don't care how ugly that area of your life is or how hurtful it was in that area of your life. Let me just tell you something. Your mess isn't the worst mess that God has ever seen. God sees, he's omniscient, meaning he sees all things actual and potential. That means he's seen, he's seen all of our mess plus the mess of the entire world, past generations, future generation, current generation, all at the same time. The stuff that people know that we know and the people, the stuff that we, the part of our testimony we didn't share in the youth group. God knows all of those different things and he's still pushing towards us to say, I want to use you. And he said, but I, I, I want to use you on this level, but I want you to let Christ and his finished work on the cross, Christ has already paid for it. So you don't have to even be embarrassed about it. You don't have to be frustrated about it because Christ has already taken care of the thing that's in secret, that's in brokenness, and that's in chains. And he's offering himself to you saying, I don't, I don't, I don't want you to just be, there, there's no such thing as, 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 as non-Christian Christianity. I want you to be a full throttle monstrositous Christian for my glory. I want you to have a ferocious passion for me. And I want you to get to the point in your life where you're saying, God, I want to open up every single door in my life and I want to invite you in to deal with every single thing. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but I just want to let you know today that God is waiting to deal with every single broken issue in your life. Your greatest point of embarrassment, your greatest point of shame is a great opportunity for God himself to meet you in that encounter and not judge you for it, but let the glory of the blood of Christ cover that thing and you powerfully submit to him. And then you say, God, I'm exalted. This above the mindset that I had, I'm exalted. Christ above this, I'm Christ. In other words, Christ wants to be flat foot thrown with his crown cocked to the front in every single area of your life. That's why the Bible says, set Jesus aside as a Lord in your heart. Do that today, and I pray that there is no area of our lives that's uncharted area and uncharted regions for the blood and glory of God. Father, we honor you that you give us the grace and strength to break free from strongholds. Now just pray today. God, as we look at 2 Corinthians and saw that, that a stronghold is a mindset, as you end this semester, pray that you would end it with a sober seriousness, even though there's celebration to be celebrated. But Lord God, help us to say, we may not be doing homework this break, but I want to put in some work in my devotional time and in my prayer time with the Lord 
when I'm searching my heart and I'm getting it in with Jesus, we're chopping it up in the scriptures and I'm talking to my, 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 my tight-knit community where we're dealing with issues for real, for real, no plastic, no plastic surgery Christianity in the place, God, but straight, biblical, ferocious, I want Jesus Christianity. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Take care.